So tonight's seminar is about slow pitch jigging. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how I was first introduced to slow pitch jigging. You know, I consider myself a pretty good fisherman. You know, I've been on the water for 44 years. I've targeted everything from blue runners to giant bluefin tuna and everything in between. And I really pride myself on spending a lot of time preparing accordingly and really doing the very best that I can when I'm out on the water and making the most of every opportunity. So three years ago, I'm fishing on a boat out of Key West with a group of guys. We're way offshore fishing for snapper, grouper, okay, trophy-sized mutton snappers and big groupers. That was a target species. And I spent a lot of time preparing for this trip, as I usually do. I had a whole truckload of rods, coolers, fresh bait, all this good stuff. And again, I really pride myself on being a good bottom fisherman, especially, because it takes a lot of skill and a lot of talent to really be effective with trophy-sized mutton snappers and groupers and a variety of other species that you find out there. So as we get set up on our first drift, on our first spot during this four-day trip, there's a guy on the boat, you know, 10, 20 feet away from me, and he whips out these little rods that look like little Mickey Mouse rods. And I start giggling, you know, I look at these things and he's treating them with care as if they're made out of gold. And I'm kind of just giggling in the background, looking over, I'm like, this guy has no idea what he is up against. We're fishing 300 feet of water, you know, a rocky bottom, a lot of structure. We're targeting these strong fish that on eight foot conventional rods, they'll kick your butt. They'll really kick your butt on pretty beefy gear. And he whips out these little noodles, what I call them. They look like toys. And I said, what a googan, what a joke. You know, this guy's a joke. He's got no idea what to expect. Four days later, the only Guggen on that boat was me, okay? <laughs> because this guy smoked me, absolutely crushed me, and it was really a humbling experience. You know, I'm standing there fishing, I've got the freshest bait, the, you know, the, literally a goggle eye that was alive the day before. And I've got the perfect rig, fluorocarbon leader, the perfect hook, everything, to, my presentation is just on point, and I can't get a bite literally cannot get a bite, me and 19 other anglers. And yet every time I turn around, this guy's been double over hooked up to a quality fish, one after another. And after a while, of course, curiosity got the best of me. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, what in the world is going on here? What is happening? I don't understand why this guy is catching fish and I'm not catching fish. It really, it bothered me. It hurt my feelings, actually. So. I finally realized, I said, the reason is he's fishing live bait and I'm fishing a dead bait. Now, he wasn't fishing a live bait at all. He was fishing a slow pitch jig. Okay, he was fishing a piece of metal. But it clicked in my head that he was bringing that piece of metal to life. The fish didn't know he was fishing a piece of metal. The fish thought he was fishing a live, you know, they thought what they were eating was a live bait fish. And he had that ability with this tackle to not only bring that metal jig to life, but the ability to make it do whatever he wanted it to do at any level in the water column. And when he hooked the fish, he wasn't fighting that fish the way that we typically would fight fish by lifting, pumping, reeling down, all of that strain. He just casually, calmly stood there, rod was bent double over, and he just turned the handle, and up came this 20-pound red grouper. And then up came a 15-pound mutton. And this went on over and over. The guy never broke a sweat. And I'm like, what is going on? So I got off that boat, and truth of the matter is I didn't think much of it. You know, just real busy doing everything that we're doing, you know, with the magazine, with the TV show, didn't think much of it. A year later, I'm on the same boat, okay? Different group of guys, same thing, prepared, you know, as best as I possibly could. And here's this guy from Michigan, okay? He's a dentist up in Michigan, or some kind of doctor, not a dentist, sorry some kind of doctor up in Michigan. Guy doesn't even fish in salt water. The only time he fishes salt water is when he comes down to Key West to fish on this boat. And he whips out these little noodle rods, these little toys, and proceeds to smoke me again, okay, throughout the whole trip. Won the pool. He literally, one guy single-handedly outfished the entire boat, okay, the entire boat. And during the trip, of course, now, I'm paying more attention and I'm talking to him more. And I finally walked off that boat and I said, that's it, that's it. I need to understand 
what is going on here? Because we're all familiar with jigging, right? We've all done vertical jigging. We've all fished a wide variety of artificial lures in every venue, you know? So jigging is nothing new. You know, I remember 25 years ago, jigging yellowfin and bluefin tuna up in the canyons, you know, was something we did decades ago. But this was different. This was completely, completely different. The rod was different, the reel was different, the jig was different, the fish fighting was different, everything was different. So I got off that boat and I said, that's it. I'm gonna make it a mission to learn as much as I can about this technique. And I started to do some research. And I quickly learned that there's just not a lot of information out there. There really isn't. There's not a lot of information. This, again, is going back today. There's a wealth of information out there, thanks to me, you know, partially, and other people who have been kind enough to share all of this information, but still not very much. And I dug deeper and deeper and finally had to get into some Japanese websites because that's where slow pitch jigging was invented, where it was created and perfected. And I quickly learned Japanese. No, I'm only kidding. Okay. So, I get on these sites and, and I start to realize that this is a tactic that was developed in Japan, in Asia, to fish highly pressured waters because there's so many people there, we know that, and there, the commercial fishing regulations have really not been very strict over the years, so they pretty much wiped out everything. So anglers now need to go deeper and target new species in different venues that you just typically can't do with conventional tackle. You know, when I say conventional, standard gear. So they've developed new rods and new jigs and new line and new reels and this entirely new system on how to target these fish. So I decided, that's it, I'm hooked. I am absolutely gonna dive into this 100%. And the truth is, it came at a time in my life when I needed this, okay? I, again, have been fishing for 44 years, and for the last 18 years, publishing Florida Sport Fishing Magazine, for the last nine years, producing our show. I live fishing, I work fishing, I sleep fishing, my life revolves around fishing. On a Saturday, guess what I want to do? You would think, right? Well, I had reached a point where I said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go kite fishing because, you know what? I've caught so many sailfish. I'm so lucky. You know, I'm so privileged that I've had an opportunity to catch so many sailfish. On a Saturday morning, I just didn't feel like getting up and going kite fishing. I want to go trolling dolphin. Again, I've been so privileged to catch so many dolphin. If I never catch another dolphin for the rest of my life, I'm still going to be very happy. I'll die a happy man. Okay, so I really, I lost my spark. I still loved it, still had a passion for fishing, obviously surrounded by fishing in every way. What's, I'm looking at myself right now on TV, for the love of God. Okay, I mean, I can't get away from it. I really can't. So again, it, it, it consumed my life, but I had reached a point where I needed something new. Something I needed a new spark and slow pitch jigging did it for me. It gave me an opportunity to say, hey, here's an entirely new way of thinking, of thinking about how to fish. Here's an entirely new way to fish, an entirely new way to present baits. And I decided I'm gonna go in head over heels, okay? And I thought about it and I said, the first thing I need to do is of course get my hands on some slow pitch gear. Where do you get slow pitch rods? I started looking everywhere and the only option was $1,000 to $1,200 rods from Japan. And that was if you were lucky enough to even get your hands on one. And I assure you that I'm not spending 1200 bucks on a rod coming from Shanghai or somewhere that I've never even touched. Okay, it's not gonna happen. So getting gear was challenging, but certainly there were a number of companies out there that do and did you know, produce slow pitch tackle. And even Chaos, my rod sponsor, didn't have slow pitch rods. Otherwise, I certainly would have come here. And that was my intention to say, hey, I'm going to design a line of rods that we can build here, you know, and that we can use here and retail. But in order to do that, first I need to go out and understand what am I doing? Okay, I need to learn. I need to understand this. So I went on this mission and I got myself a half a dozen prototype rods loaded them up with the right reels, with what I thought was the right line, and I made a commitment and said, I'm going. Every second that I could go fishing, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna go slow pitch jigging. And really, a lot of that time was alone. 
because I wanted to go out and spend eight hours jigging. But you know what? Nobody else did. No, right? Nobody else did. To me, it wasn't about I want to come home with a full cooler full of fish. It was never about that. It was about I want to go out there and master this technique. And in order to do it, I've got to make this commitment. Well, you tell your buddy, hey, we're going to go out there and go jigging. And in 30 minutes, he doesn't catch anything. When, when are we going to go snapper fishing? When are we going to do this? When are we going to do that? When are we going to do this? So finally, I decided I'm not doing it. I'm not falling into that trap. So I spent a tremendous amount of time alone and with my wife at the time out there just jigging and just learning. And trust me when I tell you, I made a lot of mistakes. I lost so many jigs. I, lo I probably lost $5,000 in jigs in the first six months okay, of jigging. Why? Because, and we'll get into jigs in a minute, but I thought right out of the gate that I need the most expensive jigs, 50 to 70 bucks a pop. Okay, 50 to 70 bucks for one jig right there, $50. No hooks, okay, at all. No swivel, nothing, just a jig. And you can't get them locally. You have to buy them overseas. So here I am, without my wife knowing at the time, spending hundreds of dollars on jigs. And then I'd go out there and I'd get a bite, and boom, I'd either get cut off, a knot would come undone, you know, a lot of different things happen. But from each of those scenarios, I learned more and more and more and more, until I finally believed that I had a great understanding of what I was doing, what I was looking for in a rod, what sort of action it needed, and certainly, while there's some great product that's out there on the shelf right now from various manufacturers, some off-the-shelf kind of stuff, you know, on a custom side, I had to make a decision. Am I building tackle for the general public? Am I building tackle for me? So I decided to build a series of rods that were designed specifically for what I learned and how I fish, but certainly versatile enough for everybody. And we'll get into the rods more in a second. So as I went out there slow pitch jigging, I spent a lot of time focusing on the details. First was the environment. I had decided that I knew this worked. I knew the tactic worked. Did it work here? And what did I have to do to make it work here? Because we all fish here, right? We all fish off the southeast coast of Florida. So what did I have to do to make it work here? And I thought about our different venues, our reef lines, and the different various species that we catch out here. And I thought, what could I possibly catch on slow pitch jigs? Thus far, I've caught bonitas, blackfin tuna, skipjack. I've caught kingfish, cereal mackerel, Spanish mackerel, vermilion snapper, yellow snapper, uh, I mean yellow eye snapper, mutton snapper, gray tile fish, black belly rose fish, dolphin, trigger fish, the list goes on and on. Greater amberjack, almaco jack, lesser jacks, blue runners, flounder, basically every single thing that swims out here except there are two fish that I have not caught yet, one of them being a sailfish on a slow pitch jig or a wahoo. I do believe I had a wahoo that just smoked me one day and that was the end of that because we're not fishing wire. The, one of the highlights of my slow pitching career locally was slow pitch jigging a swordfish. Okay. Was I targeting swordfish? Absolutely not. I was targeting snappers and groupers and tilefish in 600 feet of water. And I hooked a fish, fought really awkward, the whole way I'm like, it's a grouper. No, it's not a grouper. It's this. No, it's not. You know how you're always guessing, and I'm famous for guessing. Let me just tell you that. My camera guy's like, shut up. That's not what it is. Okay, I can't use that piece. I'm always, I've got it dialed in thinking I know what it is, and half the time I'm wrong. So I'm literally, I'm there with my wife, and I say, oh, it's a grouper. But then it went right back to the bottom, and I'm like, well, that's not a grouper. Ended up being a juvenile swordfish, about 25 to 30 pounds. Certainly not a big fish, but it wasn't about the size of the fish. It was about the fact that I just slow pitched a swordfish. Okay, so that proved to me right there that everything, everything eats slow pitch jigs. Everything. And that's what's so cool. One of the really cool things about this tactic and about this technique, it's not about I'm going fishing today and I'm targeting one species. That's not what this is about at all. This is about I'm going fishing today and I don't know what I'm going to catch. It might be cobia. 
It might be groupers, it might be snappers, it might be tunas, it might be jacks, it might be kingfish. I don't know what I'm going to catch. And I don't know about you guys, but I like to catch fish. Anybody else on my side here, right? Okay, I like to catch fish. So certainly there has been plenty of occasions where we've come home with a fish box full of something or another, and other guys didn't catch anything. Now I'm not suggesting that slow pitch jigging is the answer to all of your prayers, and that you're going to go out there and suddenly every time you drop a jig, you're going to hook a trophy fish, because that's not true. Okay, And there are certainly certain species where there are far better techniques to target them. For example, dolphin go trolling. You want to catch sailfish? Go fly a kite. Okay? That's not what this tactic was designed for. But if you want to catch demersal species, bottom predators, there is no, I am convinced there is no better tactic. So as I learned everything that I did out here that I'm going to share with you, I decided to now go back on that boat where I got smoked. Okay, but I made a commitment that I'm only taking this, that I'm not bringing a single piece of bait, I'm not bringing a single bait rod, and I'm going to slow pitch jig for four days. And remember that guy that I told you caught more than the entire boat? Well, that was now me. Okay, and that proved to myself right there that this is really something special. So I, and I've since been back many times and have caught countless different species, you know, I can't even count how many. I've also realized that there's almost no fish that you can't catch on this tackle. And even though you'll see throughout this seminar and at the end of the seminar by coming up and checking out this gear that it looks incredibly fragile and incredibly light, you're mistaken. This is a weapon. This is a highly sophisticated piece of fishing equipment. This is not a toy. This is a $1,200 to $1,500 outfit. Okay, and that's what you could expect to pay for a quality slow pitch outfit, rod, reel, line, etc. Okay, if it's under 500 bucks, it's a piece of garbage, it's not an actual slow pitch rod. Okay, so keep that in, I'm talking rod, reel, the whole combination. So expect to pay, but you get what you pay for, it. and it's very important that you're using quality gear in this application. As an example, one of the times I'm out here. I'm dropping my jig, and of course, like everybody, you know, you let your jig go, and immediately you watch it, you know, sink into the depths. And out of the corner of my eye, I see a hammerhead shark. Not a big one, maybe 200 pounds, 175, 200 pounds, come racing under the bow right toward my jig. And this is all happening so fast, the hammerhead shark. And I said, uh, boom, and he ate it. And immediately I'm hooked up to a hammerhead shark. And I'm by myself on my boat. So I'm sitting there fighting this fish on this outfit right here. And I say to myself, this is a waste of time. There's no way in the world I'm going to catch a 200-pound hammerhead shark on this outfit. But I'm not going to bust them off. First, I want my jig. Okay, I want my $50 jig back. Second, as I start getting deeper and deeper into this battle with this shark, I decide, no, I'm going to go to the limits with this because I want to see what can I really do with this? What are the limits of this ultra lightweight slow pitch jigging outfit? An hour and 40 minutes later, that shark was right up next to the boat looking at me. Okay? So he didn't get me in any structure. He's not going to break me off. I was fortunate when had to jig right in the corner of his mouth so he didn't cut me off on my leader because I certainly wasn't fishing wire. So in turn, that gave me an opportunity to see how much heat I could really apply with this gear. The same thing happened to me down off the keys on a different shark. We were on a wreck catching really big African pompanos. I hook a giant fish that I'm fighting, that I'm praying is this enormous African pompano, and it's a 300-pound shark. Okay? After an exhausting battle, I get him right to the top, right there. Now, of course, right there, that was the end of it. but. You know, so there's almost nothing that you can't catch with this tackle. Your only limitation is line capacity, right? Is line capacity. But even the smallest slow pitch jigging reels will still hold 400, 500 yards of line, even more depending on the diameter of the line. So nevertheless, you know, once I realized that this was something special and I was convinced that it would work and does work so well around Florida, I decided to push the limits even further. 
And I've been to, you know, really some great destinations, Guatemala, Panama, Mexico, Belize, really all over fishing. And I decided that I want to go to Costa Rica to a lodge that I've been at a couple of times where I've had phenomenal offshore fishing for marlin, tuna, dolphin. But I didn't want to go there and target the pelagic species. I wanted to go there and target bottom fish with my slow pitch gear. And when I told that to the guy, he said, you're going to fly from there to here, and you don't want to catch a marlin? I'm like, no, I don't want to catch a marlin. I don't want to leave sight of land. I want to go fish for groupers and snappers right on the bottom. And I did that for five days. And I'll tell you what, what I experienced there was one of the most epic fishing trips of my entire life. Because these were fish in 600 feet of water that I've never seen a lure before. It, it, there was no pressure. There wasn't another boat within 100 miles of us. Every single drop was a 10 to 30 pound grouper, one after the other till your arms fell off. We would fish shallower and catch golden trevally, uh, rooster fish, anything, because everything eats a slow pitch jig. Why? Because you're mimicking a wounded bait fish. And that's a very important fact to remember, that you're not fishing a piece of metal. This is not a piece of metal. Maybe to you it is, but not to the fish and not to me. When I look at this, I always say that my goal is to bring that piece of metal to life. I want this to be alive. And you know what? Sometimes a piece of metal, a jig, is better even than a live bait. You know why? Because tell me the last time you can control your goggle eye. And you can control what depth in the water that goggle eye is swimming at. You can't. It's alive. It has a mind of its own. But I am this jig's mind, okay? I'm the one that controls it. So if I'm targeting bottom fish, for example, tile fish, and I know that tile fish hug the bottom, they're not going to swim more than a few feet off the bottom. I could keep my jig alive in that portion of the water column, right in the strike zone. I could fish the bottom 10 feet of the water column, drop it right back to the bottom, pitch it 10 feet, drop it right back to the bottom, etc. If I'm targeting blackfin tuna that I know swim throughout the water column, I can have my live bait erratically swimming throughout the water column. Now remember earlier I mentioned that we're all familiar with vertical jigging, high speed vertical jigging. That is something that really has caught on in popularity over the last 10 years or so, maybe even a little bit more. And when people hear jigging, you know what the first thing they think of is, oh, I'm not doing that. That's tiring, man. That's tiring, right? You got to bump the rod and turn the real handle, and move. it's exhausting. Do not think that that's what this is about, because this is completely different. This is not high-speed vertical jigging. When you are high-speed vertical jigging, you are mimicking not wounded bait fish, but escaping bait fish. See that? I'm turning the handle very fast as I'm pumping the rod, and that jig is moving through the water at a rapid pace right throughout the water column. So I'm mimicking escaping prey. Instinctively, a predator is going to go after that. On the other hand, with slow pitch jigging, I'm not, my goal is not to mimic escaping prey. My goal is to mimic wounded prey. And I want to keep that wounded prey item in the strike zone for as long as I possibly can. If I'm targeting mutton snapper and grouper, do I want my jig 50 feet off the bottom? No, I want my jig two feet off the bottom. So that's a big advantage, one of the many big advantages to slow pitch jigs. So again, not only is the tactic effective here, but it's effective everywhere. I've been to the Bahamas, okay, and we slow pitch jigged in the Bahamas and absolutely got our clocks cleaned on this one particular ledge with these big black trevallis, okay, it was like a GT almost, mean, mean, mean fish. Right on a ledge, you would drop that jig down, you'd hook up, and you'd lose almost every single one, okay, you just couldn't stop them, okay, they were just so big and so powerful, and as soon as they took you over that ledge, that was the end of it. But we did manage to catch a few, and again, it just proves on how effective this is everywhere. Now, let's get into the tackle for a second. There's, first and foremost, is the rod, okay, is the rod. Slow pitch jigging is all about the rod, and it starts with the blank itself, 
Okay, now again, there's some great product, off the shelf stuff that's out there on the market that you certainly can get your hands on now. And as time goes along, you're gonna see even more and more slow pitch gear. Our rods that we custom built, we chose a Cape Cod blank. It's a black hole blank. It's got a little bit more beef than your typical slow pitch rod, but still very parabolic. Parabolic meaning it's a giant shock. It's a giant spring, I should say, okay? A giant spring. So essentially, this rod works like this, okay? And every time you load the rod, and what I mean by load the rod is you put it under pressure and it bends, what happens with this rod? It bends back, just like that. Everybody see that? It just springs back. And when it springs back, it pitches the jig through the water column. So you load the rod, unload the rod and it pitches the jig. And this jig, all sorts of slow pitch jigs, they don't pitch up, they pitch to the side. Hence the name slow pitch. Pitch meaning the, rod, the jig is pitched off to the side. It pitches off to the side and then it wobbles and swims back on its own. You know, the nice thing about slow pitch jigs, they do 90% of the work for you. The action of the jig itself, as long as you keep it moving, does a lot of the work for you. There's even times where you don't have to even move the rod and you'll get bites. In other words, you're slow pitch jigging, you're actively jigging, and then you stop for a second and if that jig is 20, 30, 40, 50 feet off the bottom and suddenly you stop, what's going to happen? The jig doesn't just fall like a bullet. There's no tension. It's fluttering and swimming on its own. So the rod is extremely, extremely important. And it's made out of a particular carbon fiber, a Torre carbon fiber, and it's incredibly strong. And I'm just gonna show you a little experiment real quick, a little display to show you exactly how strong this rod is. And what I've got here, if you don't see, is a big weight. I think it weighs, what does that say, 18 pounds. And hopefully you could all see this. So don't think that this blank, just because it's thin, is not strong. Look at that thing bend. Okay, now, I can't. <laughs> it won't look. But the amount of power in that rod is incredible. It really, really is. So don't think that you can't put some heat on a fish because you can. Now remember, when you are fishing, there are a lot of variables, including something called a drag on your reel. Obviously, sitting here trying to lift 18 pounds of lead with no drag will probably destroy any rod. But again, just an example of how powerful these rods really are. They're typically short, as you can see, anywhere from 5.6 to 6.6. Okay, this one happens to be 6.3, so you don't need a long rod when you're slow pitch jigging, that's actually counterintuitive, counterproductive. You need a shorter rod, and we'll get into that in a second. And one of the things that you'll see right out of the gate that are really important is that the rod is spiral wrapped, it's acid wrapped. And that means that the guides start on top, right up on top, but the guides then transition 180 degrees and end on the bottom, like a spinning rod. So it starts on top and ends on the bottom. Okay. Now what that does is it serves two purposes. One purpose is to prevent the rod from twisting in your hand while you're fighting big fish, okay, strong fish. It really helps prevent that rod from twisting. The next thing that it does is you'll notice, and I, hopefully you can all see that, but that line never touches the blank. The line never touches the blank. No matter how hard that rod is loaded, no matter what the load is on the rod, the line will never touch the blank. That's very, very important when you're fishing this type of line, which we'll get into in a second. The next thing you'll notice about the slow pitch rod, in addition to the blank material, the small guides, acid wrap, we've got a blank through construction. Okay, so there's Really, this also serves two purposes. One, it keeps the weight down. Two, when this rod is under my arm, I now have a triangular grip, okay? I'm holding the rod in my armpit. I could feel the blank in my armpit. My hand is cupping the side of the reel and holding the reel seat, and my right hand is on the reel handle. So I have this triangular position, and the rod is really an extension of my own body. 
It is so sensitive that I kid you not, in 500 feet of water, I could feel a juvenile flounder the size of my palm eat my jig in 500 feet of water. Think about that for a second. A 50-story building, you're standing on top, and you drop this jig 500 feet down, and you have current that you're dealing with, and you have a fish that weighs two ounces. A flat little fish that weighs two ounces that hits your jig and you can feel that bite. That's how incredibly sensitive these rods are. In addition, the grips, you'll notice this forward grip doesn't need to be way up here. It doesn't need to be a large grip and add any extra weight because we're never holding the rod up here. That's not how you slow pitch jig and that's not how you fight fish. You're always holding the rod right here. You're cupping the reel. My hand never leaves this position. Okay, and you might as well glue it to that position right there. It never leaves this position. So you don't need a longer foregrip. You don't need a long butt grip, okay? Because again, that's not how you're using this rod. Graphite reel seat for lightweight, also for extra sensitivity, graphite reel seat. The reel, the next most important component. Listen, there's a lot of great reel manufacturers out there, you know, Shimano, Accurate makes an absolutely awesome jigging reel. I use the Daiwa Saltiga reels, the Star Drag reels. I've been fishing Daiwa reels forever. They work for me. Okay? I like these new Saltiga Star Drag reels for a variety of reasons. One is they're narrow, so I could cup the spool and literally just get that perfect grip. If it had a really wide spool, a large arbor, a wide spool, it would be harder for me to wrap my hand around it. So a small spool allows me to grip that and get a good, solid, comfortable, firm grip on that reel. The star drag is very easy to adjust. Don't think, you know, there's all these fancy schmancy lever drag reels out there, right? And they generally cost more than the star drag reels. And everybody thinks, oh, the star drag reel, that's like yesterday's technology. Nobody uses star drag reels anymore. Eh, wrong. Okay, star drag reels serve an absolutely great purpose. They're super reliable. They're easy to use. You know what? I can put this rod in your hand and say, tighten that drag for me. He may have never fished a day in his life. Have you ever fished in your life? Okay, a few times. And I can say, tighten that drag, and he just knows instinctively to move that star a little bit forward, you know, a couple clicks at a time. With a lever drag, with an inexperienced angler, how easy is it for that guy to pull that lever back? You know, it's easy to make a mistake. Now, of course, if you're dialed in, you're a seasoned angler, you're slow pitch jigging, which you should be an experienced fisherman at that level, there's obviously nothing wrong with lever drag reels. It, they, again, is a great option. But don't think that a star drag reel is a bad option because it isn't. And in this particular application, I prefer the star drag reels. Next, it's light. It's aluminum. It's very light because remember, you're jigging for a long period of time. The key with slow pitch jigging is to continue to slow pitch jig. Don't go out there, fish for 30 minutes, not catch anything, and go, oh, well, I'm tired. It's too heavy. I'm, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to do it any longer. That's not what this is about. The entire outfit has to be super comfortable. So this way you can continue to jig throughout the day. And, and trust me when I tell you, the more you do it, the easier it gets, the more of a rhythm that you get into, and we'll talk about that too, okay? And the more experience you'll have, or the better experience that you'll have. Next is retrieval ratio, the gear ratio. It is very important that you fish a relatively, I don't want to say a relatively, that you fish a fast reel, a fast reel. With every turn of that handle, I want to gain as much line as I can. Why? Because I'm not fishing in 80 feet of water. I'm fishing in up to 800 feet of water, okay? I'm fishing deep. You know why I'm fishing deep? Because you ever go out here, anybody go out here this last Saturday? Okay. Of the 10,000 boats between Port Everglades and Boca Inlet, 9,990 of them are shallower than 200 feet. They're all fishing the edge. Everybody's fishing the edge, okay? For kingfish, wahoo, tunas, snappers, diving, snorkeling, tubing, kite surfboarding, whatever. Any water sport you can imagine, they're all within sight of land right here within a couple hundred feet, you know, a couple hundred feet deep. 
Well, I had decided that's not where I want to slow pitch jig. Okay, I don't want fish there. I want to fish deeper. I want to explore areas that see less pressure. Okay, that see less pressure and target fish that not everybody is targeting. So I decided I want to fish deeper. So at first it was two to 400 feet and really mastering those depths. And then it went to four to 600 feet. Now I'm focused on really mastering the 600 to 800 foot region. And by having all of those venues available to me and available for me to go out and fish those areas where you're not fishing, 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 you're all not fishing the same water that I'm fishing. So for me, that's a huge advantage. Okay, it really is. So I need a reel that's fast because I, when I want to bring that jig up from the bottom, either to drop it back down or to move to another area or get on another drift, if this was a slow reel, my arm would fall off. So you need a reel that's fast. You need a reel that has a smooth drag. You don't need a, you know, immense amount of drag pressure. For example, this reel has a maximum 17 pounds of drag. Some of my other reels up to 25 pounds of drag. That's plenty. That's plenty in this particular application. So don't judge a reel by its maximum drag pressure and say, well, it only has 17 pounds of drag. That's not going to be adequate for slow pitch jigging because that's incorrect. It will be. It's all about balance. And remember that too. Slow pitch jigging is about balance. It's about a balance between the rod, the reel, the line, the leader, the jig, the hooks, the swip, the little split rings, the solid ring, everything is a system and it's about balance. So again, the reel in my case, Daiwa, Saltiga, they make a variety of different sizes. So I've got the 20s, I've got the 15s, I've got the size 30s, the 35s, the size 40s. They're all essentially the same reel up until about that 30 size when the spool gets to be larger. They're just wider. And what happens when you have a wider spool? More line capacity, more line capacity. So I could still fish that same reel that I'm comfortable with, but now I can have more line capacity. And if I'm fishing in 800 feet of water, I want more line capacity, right? Okay, I don't wanna fish this till I see the spool. Okay, that does, and that's happened. I'm like, oh, there's a spool, that's not gonna work. Okay, so you need something with more line capacity. So the reel, like I said, very important. Next is the line. We fish PE line. PE line is like the next generation of braid. The latest line that I'm fishing is this new Diamond Braid X9. It has nine carriers. Carriers are the little threads that create this braid. This may seem like one string to you. This is not one string. This is one string with nine weaves of thinner strings, essentially, fibers, that all come together to create this one ultra thin line. This PE line and this next generation of braid is incredibly strong, incredibly strong, has almost zero stretch. And what does that mean for me? Sensitivity, okay? Zero stretch equals sensitivity. And that's super important. In addition to that, zero stretch means every time I load that rod and pitch that jig, my jig is going to react to what I'm doing. If I have a giant bow of line, if I have a giant amount of slack, you know, and a lot of stretch, I'm not going to get the jig to react the way that I need it to react. So the line is super important. It's also perfectly round. And by being round, what advantage does that offer me? Less resistance in the water column. And while you may not think this is a big deal, it is an absolutely huge deal when it comes to slow pitch jigging, especially in deeper water, okay? In 100 feet, fishing 20 pound P line or 40 pound P line is not a big difference when you're fishing 100 feet of water. In 700 feet, that is a world of difference, an absolute enormous difference. Some of the best slow pitch jiggers, okay, the most experienced guys, there's one of them happens to be sitting in the back of the room right there. Everybody say hi to Benny. Okay. These guys are fishing 12, 16 pound, okay, 16 pound PE line in a thousand feet of water. Fishing jigs on the bottom with line that is literally not much thicker than your hair. 
okay? I'm not that brave. I'm down to 20 pounds, okay? Even that is ultra thin. Now, keep in mind, too, here's what's really cool, really, really cool that I found about slow pitch jigging that a lot of people don't understand. If you're fishing in 200 feet of water and you're fishing, for example, a reel loaded with 30-pound line, okay, and you're in 200 feet of water, you're holding the bottom, everything's fine. And now you want to go out and fish 700 feet of water, 800 feet of water. But what do we have out there? Current, right? A lot of current. So you say, hey, you know what? I can't fish a 200 gram jig. I need to fish a 400 gram jig. I need to fish a heavier jig. And I can't fish 20 pound line or 30 pound line. I got to fish 60 pound line because I'm fishing this heavier jig and it's much deeper water. So I got to bulk up and beef up my tackle. And you know what? That would be the logical way of thinking. That is not the slow pitch way of thinking. With slow pitch tackle, this is the exact same outfit, the same exact rod that I just showed you. Okay? This is the exact same reel that I just showed you. The one I showed you was a size 20. This is a size 30. All you can see is that the spool is wider. It's larger. But instead of having it loaded with 30 pound line, it's loaded with 20 pound with 20 pound PE. There's 1,100 yards of line on this reel. Is that enough line capacity? You're damn right it is. You know why? Because think about it. You're out there fishing in ultra deep water. I'm in 800 feet and I'm on a mission right now to jig a 30 pound golden tile fish. That's my goal, is to jig a, a big trophy golden tile fish. And I realize that when I hook that fish, if I'm by myself, which I very well may be, because everybody, nobody wants to come with me. They're like, you're crazy, dude. Or just bring me a deep drop rod, I'll drop a bait down. You can jig until your arm falls off for all I care. Okay? <laughs> Nevertheless, you've got current out there, three, four knots. You're hooked up to a 30-pound fish 900 feet down. Think about it. 900 feet down, a 30-pound aggressive golden tile fish just slammed my jig. And I've got this little, what people think is a toy, but I know it's a sophisticated weapon, okay? But I know that I need a lot of line capacity, potentially, to fight that fish and to be able to land that fish because it's about finesse. It's not about, I'm going to horse them in, I'm going to sock down the drag. No, I'm going to use my tackle and I'm going to push it to its very limits, but that may be a while, okay? I have fought fish, like I said, for close to two hours on this gear. So I'm ready for it. Plus, you know what else swims out there 900 feet on the bottom? That's right. That's right. And you know what? When my day comes again, and this time maybe it's a bigger one, maybe it's 100 pounds, okay, and he eats my jig, and I'm convinced it certainly could happen, okay, it's not going to happen sitting here, but it'll happen out there, okay, I want to have an opportunity to catch that fish. I don't want to lose that fish because I was undergunned. So, but the point I'm making, Deeper water, lighter line, not heavier line, okay? And that goes against what you may be thinking because that ultra-thin 20-pound is so thin, okay? It literally is so incredibly thin that there's almost no resistance in the water column. And just that little difference between 20 and, per se, 40 or 50 is a, it doesn't make a big difference with 100 feet, but with 900 feet, it makes a huge difference. And even though you think your jig, you'll drop that jig down and your line's going straight down, and you may think your jig is straight down there. It's not. There's a bow, right? There's a bow in your line, but you want to reduce that bow. Slow pitch jigging is the most effective when you have direct contact with your jig, where every move that you impart is reflected in the jig itself. If you have a big bow of line because I'm fishing 50 pound and the current is sweeping my 50 pound, when I, you know, load up that rod and pitch that jig, is the jig moving? Barely, because of course it has this whole entire bow. So just remember, Deeper water, more current, often means lighter line. However, make sure you've got a large enough spool to have plenty of line capacity on there. Line color means nothing. 
Okay, as far as I'm concerned, I've seen no difference whatsoever fishing blue, brown, green, orange, white. I don't care what color your braid is. I, I really don't, your PE line. I happen to fish the, you know, the tobacco uh, brown. It's a more like a greenish color, and this offshore blue is a new one that they have that I like as well because it's just more visible up at the top. But down at the bottom, the fish aren't seeing this. The next thing is the leader. This is the next equally as important part of the entire slow pitch jigging equation is the leader itself. Now remember that leader length and material both make a big difference. Monofilament fluorocarbon, this mono, makes noise in the water. You may not see it or you may not hear it, I should say, but every time you pitch that jig and this line comes tight, here, you can almost hear it right there. It makes a noise in the water. So you want to be able to present your jig as stealthy as possible because what am I trying to do? I'm trying to mimic a live bait fish, right? A wounded bait fish. I want to be as stealthy. I want to be sneaky. I want to fool these things, man. To me, this isn't a bait. This is a squid. Okay, It might be a jig to you. It might be a bait. Not to me. That's a live squid. That's all I think about is that's a squid, and I'm going to swim that thing just like it's a squid, right in front. And what eats squid? Everything. Everything eats squid. Okay. So in turn, I want to keep my presentation as stealthy as possible. So my fluorocarbon leader, and that's what this is, it's diamond presentation fluorocarbon, is going to be as thin as I could possibly get away with. But I've got to think about that and weigh it out. If I'm in shallower water, where king mackerel are a possibility. Am I going to fish 30-pound leader? Well, if I want to keep losing $50 jigs, I will. Okay, But if I know that there are toothy predators around, I'm going to bump it up to 80-pound. I'm not going to go to wire. I'll never fish wire on a slow pitch jig, but I will bump up my leader up to 80 pound. And I know it makes a huge difference because I'll land 90% of the kingfish now. The leader will be off frayed. You chop a foot off of it, you retie your jig, and you're back in business. Okay? Anything less than that, and you're just sacrificing jigs. They'll cut you off like this every time. That's if there's toothy predators around. If I'm targeting Tile fish, like gray tile fish on the bottom and anywhere from 375 to 425, you may want to write that down, okay, 30 pound, that's it, 40 at the most. I don't need anything heavier than that. They're not going to cut me off. There's no toothy fish out there. There's no structure. They live in the mud. So I'm going to narrow it down to 30 pound, lighten it up. Like I said, maybe 40 at the very, very most. It's stealthy and it's quiet. The length of the leader is another challenge. When I first started slow pitch jigging, immediately I went to a 25 foot top shot. 25 foot meaning from my braid, from my PE line, I had a 25 foot long section of fluorocarbon. Okay, as a shock absorber, because remember that PE line has no stretch, whereas the fluorocarbon or monofilament stretches like a rubber band. So it acts as a great shock absorber in most scenarios, and it's stealthy. So at 25 foot, not a problem. It was working fine. And then I went down to 20 foot, and then I went down to 15 foot, and then I went to 12 foot, and now I'm at 10 foot. And that seems to be the ideal leader length for me that I have found. I have seen absolutely zero reduction in the number of strikes that I get by going to a shorter leader. Okay, 10 foot. Also, I realized I don't need all of that shock absorbing, you know, uh, kind of benefit from a long leader because my rod is a giant shock absorber. Look at that. It's flimsy, right? Every time a fish digs, digs its head, or is going to swim away, the rod absorbs a lot of that pressure. And a lot of the slow pitch rods are even more parabolic than this, where the entire rod is like a giant U. Okay? It's just a giant bend. Okay? And that takes up a lot of that shock. So I didn't need a longer leader. And like I said, I have found that that 10 foot works perfect. That connection between the P line and the leader material. No swivels, no bulky connections, because look how small these little micro guides are. Right? I don't know what number these guides are. Obviously, these guys can tell you, but they're small. 
Okay, they're, they're almost like on a bass rod, like on a you know, casting rod. They're very, very small. So in turn, you need a very small streamlined knot that can easily flow through these guides. I've tried a lot of different knots, a lot of different scenarios. I'm down to something called the Alberto knot. Okay, very, very simple to tie, very fast, and if you tie it right, it's super strong. Super strong. It's called the Alberto knot. And you can come up, you know, and see, you, you probably can't see it from there, but it's literally tiny, tiny, tiny. It's like an eighth of an inch. Okay, it's an extremely small knot, but like I said, you could easily tie it on a rocking boat. It's great for, thin, you know, for different diameter lines, and it's incredibly strong. Alberto knot. Now from there, at the end of my leader, and before obviously we get into the technique of how to slow pitch jig, clearly we're going through all of the tackle, at the end of my leader is a solid welded ring. A small little solid welded ring. Now on the wall right here are all sorts of solid welded rings. Some of which are rated for 1,000 pound test. Do I need a 1,000 pound test solid welded ring? Do I need a 400 pound? Do I need a 200 pound? Do I need a 100 pound? Okay. Nothing more than 100 pound. Let's be honest with each other, right? Why? Because I'm never going to be putting that much pressure with this rod and reel on my jig on the fish that I'm targeting. Plus the heavier the split ring, the more junk there is in the water, the more noise there is in the water, the more terminal tackle there is in the water. It's just not a balanced outfit. And again, remember what I said about balance. Balance is everything from start to finish. So your welded ring, 75 pound, 100 pound at the very most. That's all you need for your welded ring. If you're tuna fishing in the Bahamas and slow pitch jigging, bump it up to a 200 pound welded ring. Okay, or if you're targeting big amber jacks. Okay, that's all, you know, but you don't, you certainly don't need anything more than that. From there, you'll notice one thing that's really unique about slow pitch jigs. Somebody tell me. The hooks. The hooks. There's hooks on top, there's assist hooks on top, and there's assist hooks on the bottom. Slow pitch jigging is not about catch and release. Slow pitch jigging is about catch and kill. Okay? That's really what it's about. It's not about catch and release. It isn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't be fishing four hooks. Now, what's the advantage of the four hooks? There are a number of different advantages. Number one, they act like a grapple. Okay? When a fish grabs this jig, by the time you get that fish to the boat, a majority of the time, all of the hooks are embedded in the fish. He's got two in his mouth, two stuck on the side of his face, two in the back of his head, two back here in his butt. He's got them everywhere. Okay? Not uncommon to have all of the hooks embedded in the fish. Now, truthfully, that's an advantage because we use really light thin hooks. We want, to be, we want to be stealthy, right? We want to be as stealthy as we could be. We want to be as quiet as we could be. So we use very thin wire hooks. Now if I hook a 30 pound blackfin tuna on one hook and he's got it in the corner of his mouth and it's a very thin light wire hook and I put a lot of pressure on that fish, what's going to happen? Straighten the hook out. But by having four hooks or two or three embedded in the fish, that point of contact is now dissipated to four different points. Everybody picking up what I'm throwing down? Okay, so it's all dissipated into four different points. So now I can apply a tremendous amount of pressure and not be concerned with straightening hooks. So that's another big advantage to having the hooks on top and the hooks on bottom. Some of the shorter jigs, if you're only going to fish one set of assist hooks, they should be on the top of the jig, not on the bottom of the jig, okay, if you're only going to fish one set. The hooks themselves, not only do they come in, of course, every size, 203, 0, et cetera, et cetera, but also the length of the hook. So you see how far that hangs down from the jig, okay, you can purchase or, or rig your own assist hooks with different lengths. Okay, so in this particular case, this length, you know, seems to work fine. If you have, though, a shorter jig, like this, 
Okay, and if you have assist hooks that are six inches long, what's going to happen? The hooks are going to snag each other every time. So again, it's about balance. It's about looking at that jig and looking at the hooks and making sure that they don't reach each other, okay, and that they don't tangle with each other. On top of the jig is an eye. Now on that eye is where there's a split ring. Everything is attached to the split ring. My solid ring that's on the end of the leader is attached to the split ring. The jig is attached to the split ring. The hooks are attached to the split ring. We'll call the split ring a hub. Okay, so everything is attached to that hub. On the bottom, the same thing. The hook is attached to a split ring and the jig is attached to a split ring. So if I want to switch out my jig and I want to switch this over to a different jig, bigger, lighter, different color, different style, whatever it may be, I don't have to re-rig everything. All I have to do is get my split ring pliers, open up this split ring and take the jig right off the split ring, grab another jig and put it right on the split ring. Okay, and now I'm back in business and obviously just swap out the bottom hooks. So that's how the entire hooking process works. Everything is connected via those split rings. So it's essential that you get yourself a good quality pair of split ring pliers and get to know them well because you're going to be opening and closing a lot of split rings. Okay. So that's in a nutshell how the entire slow pitch outfit is rigged from start to finish, between the line, the leader, the solid ring, the split rings, the hooks, the jig, the connections that we talked about. And by the way, the knot that I use to tie my leader to the welded ring, okay, to the solid ring at the end of my leader is just an improved clinch knot, a fisherman's knot. You know what I'm talking about? Around, around, in the hole, back through the hole. Okay. I caught an 824 pound giant bluefin tuna on a hook that I tied on with that knot. It's now my favorite knot. Okay. If it withstood that since that day, some 20 years ago, okay, it's been a proven knot. As long as it's tied properly, it's bulletproof. It really is. So now is the jig selection process. Now keep in mind, like a good golfer, who's got a variety of different golf clubs suited for different you know, conditions, I'm the same way with my slow pitch tackle. I go out and I bring eight rods. I bring an entire set of eight rods. That's all that I bring is my slow pitch rods, eight, to eight rods. A lot of them are similar, some are different. I don't know what the conditions are going to be like when I get out there. I may want to fish in 400 feet of water, but you know what, I find that the conditions are absolutely ideal. There's a little bit of current, there's a little bit of wind, whatever the case is, and I'm only drifting really slowly, maybe like 0.5. And I say, you know, this is ideal conditions to go fish deeper, maybe seven, eight, nine hundred feet of water, okay, under these conditions. And I know I'm going to experience more current out there, but at least I know I'm not starting with three and a half knots of current. So I want to make sure that I'm equipped for that. On the other hand, I may say I want to fish for mutton snapper on the edge of the reef in 130 to 160 feet of water and slow pitch jig them where I can get away with a lighter outfit. So I always bring a variety of different gear, rigged and ready, so I'm always ready to switch it up. Plus, depending on the current will determine the type of jig that I'm fishing, as will my target species. If I'm looking for blackfin tuna, an extremely common target out here, you know what, here's a perfect example. I want something that really mimics, you know, a fast moving bait fish or even a squid because of course we know blackfin tuna eat squid, okay, and let me assure you, blackfin tuna eat more squid than they eat anything else. And when you can't find the blackfin tuna, it's because they're on the bottom eating squid, okay, in the middle of the day. I'm, I'm telling you that. So the only way to target those fish is to drop a jig really, really deep. So I want something that looks like either a squid or a fast moving bait fish that I can manipulate through the water column. Okay. Color, very simple. It's got to have some flash and it has to have some glow. That, that's really the best combination that I have found. Some flash and some glow. Have other jigs, you know, there's some stuff like Anybody ever see a bait fish this color? 
There's a whole school of bait in Hillsborough Inlet right now, swimming around. They all look like this. You guys haven't seen them? Okay. Obviously, there isn't. There's no bait fish that's bright orange like this. It's not about the color. It's about shades, okay? These fish see dark shades, light shades, and sometimes the most awkward of all colors is the most productive of all lures, especially in certain scenarios. And I'll give you one of those certain scenarios as an example. Anybody ever see a bait fish that looks like this? Okay, red and gold kind of like that. I mean, it, it, it can kind of sort of look like a bunker, a menhaden or something like that. But fishing the Gulf of Mexico on a particular trip caught a red grouper. And when I brought that red grouper up on a, on a different jig, in his mouth he had some sort of perch, some sort of like sand perch that he ate right off the bottom. It was still literally in his gullet. And it looked exactly like this. It was this color. It had these gold and yellow bands, you know, these vertical bands across its side. And I looked at that little perch and I went, hmm, I want to try something. And I whipped out this jig right here that looked just like what he was eating, dropped it to the bottom, and for the next two hours, I think I had four or five red grouper up to 20 pounds, just literally working this within a couple of feet right off the bottom because it matched the hatch perfectly. Was it because it was, ooh, another one's flagged. Was it because it was gold and red? I don't know. You know, it just seemed to match the hatch. So sometimes color does play a role, but I'm a firm believer, action plays a much larger role than the color of the jig is the action that you impart on the jig. So I'm going to have a variety of jigs and my jig bag, you can come up and take a look at it, one of a few jig bags, okay, probably weighs, I don't know, 100 pounds, you know, you know, a lot, probably worth more than my truck, okay? Um, but it's important to me because I'm very selective. I'm always looking at those jigs going, well, I'm going to try this one. What am I trying to mimic? Do I, you know, what's the current like? I'm always experimenting. And then, of course, I have my go-to jigs that I know that's, I have so much confidence in that jig that I always have a rod rigged with that jig. And one of those jigs happens to be one that I showed you. It's called a rector, a seafloor control rector. This, by the way, is one of those $50, $60 jigs. Okay, but I'll tell you what, worth every penny, baby. Worth every penny, that jig right there. So nevertheless, variety of different sizes for starters. I have found that on the low side out here, 150 grams is about the smallest jig that I'll ever fish. You certainly can fish lighter jigs, 70, 90, 110 grams, but usually 125 or 150 grams is about the lightest jig that I'm going to fish out here. All the way on up to 400, 450 gram jigs out in some deep water targeting these golden tile fish. I'm also on a mission to try and jig barrel fish out here. So really trying to accomplish angling feats that are not easily done. It's about the challenge. And for me, that also is an attraction to slow pitch jigging is the challenge. It's not, let me go out there and catch as many fish as I possibly can, okay? Because I don't know if I would be slow pitch jigging. It's not, let me go out there and catch, you know, as many glamorous sailfish, then I definitely wouldn't be slow pitching. It's not about that. But the evolution of a fisherman, you know, I like to say, when you first start fishing, you want to catch whatever you can catch, right? Doesn't matter what it is. I just want to catch fish. I don't care if it's a trigger fish, a grunt, a lane snapper. I don't care what it is. I want action. I want to go out there and catch whatever I can. Then as you continue to advance and you continue to progress in your angling career, suddenly it's, you know, I don't want to catch, you know, I want to catch dolphin. Okay, I don't want to catch dolphin. I'm going dolphin fishing. When you get back to the dock and you have 10 dolphin in the boat, it didn't matter if you call them trolling, chunking, how it thrown a bucktail, but you caught dolphin. You accomplished what you wanted to accomplish, right? I'm to a point now where I'm like picky. I want to catch a golden tile fish on a particular jig with a particular rod with particular line targeting that one fish. One fish. It's kind of like man versus fish. Okay? And that's my goal with all of the species that I go after now. But I find that by doing that, I'm still catching a lot more 
than I ever thought that I would because everything eats slow pitch jigs. Like I said earlier, you're bringing that jig to life. So again, it's really an unbelievable tactic that is, can allow you to set goals for yourself that are so challenging but yet so rewarding. Okay, so rewarding because it isn't about what you put in the boat. Anyone that's an avid slow pitch jigger or an avid jig fisherman will tell you what is it about? The bite. It's about the bite. It's about the strike. It's about the fact that I fooled, and it doesn't have to be a giant fish. It's not about that. I fooled a six pound, six pounds, okay? It's not, not huge, six pounds, okay? But it's a six pound blue line tile fish in 470 feet of water. I fooled that fish with this piece of metal. This piece of metal. Let's see you do that. Okay. Not a, now, I, if I wanted to catch 10 tile fish, I'd probably drop down. You would think I would drop down a rig loaded with squid, right? No. I'm going to keep doing this, and I'd probably outfish you even with the bait. So that's what's so exciting about this is how effective it could really be. So again, jigs anywhere from 150 to 450, depending on the venue, depending on the depth. As far as the color, I think it's important to have dark shades and light shades. Glow is, all, is always you know, really important. It gives the fish something to see. It's just another element. As far as the style of the jig, you know, the one I showed you earlier, and it'll probably be easier, you may see it a little bit better. This is a spoon shape, a leaf shape. It's got a big concave kind of face to it. It is designed to wobble and to pitch and to swim more erratically than, for example, something that is straight, like this, okay, that doesn't have a concave face. So this is a great jig, a great style jig to mimic a squid swimming right off the bottom. The problem is, or I don't want to say the problem, but one of the factors to consider is the wider a jig is and the more of a concave face it has, the more it's going to catch the current and the more the current is going to affect how that jig performs. So when you have a lot of current, you want a long slender jig. When you don't have a lot of current, a shorter, fatter, leaf type style jig can be deadly effective. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? If you have a lot of current, you want something sleek, you want something sharp, you want something that's not going to catch a lot of water. Here's a jig, a 400 gram jig that we fish out in deep water. Okay? You can see how narrow it is. It's like an arrow, right? It's like an arrow. When you drop this down, deploy it in the depths, this thing drops like a bullet literally just flies through the water column like a bullet. But once it's under load and you're slow pitching it, it's not going like this anymore. Now it's laying sideways. Okay? And it pitches off to the side and wobbles and pitches off to the side and wobbles and pitches off to the side and wobbles. It's not going like this any longer. But to penetrate those depths, you need a lure that's not going to catch a lot of water. Does that make sense to everybody? That's why it's so important to have a variety of different style jigs and different sizes. Another example, there are some really unique, unique shaped jigs out there. Here's one very similar, somewhat similar to the Rector that you can see has a huge concave face. It's like a giant spoon. I mean, you literally could eat soup with this thing. Okay. On the back side, it has some glow. Okay. It has a sharp keel. On the front, it has a big wobble. This thing wobbles like crazy and pitches off to the side and swims like, like crazy. The problem is if you have more than like 0.3 knots of current, you can't control this jig. Okay. It's all over the place. It's coming way up, you know, in scoping way out. And remember, the more of a vertical connection that you have to your jig, the more effective slow pitch jigging is going to be. If my jig is way out there, it's not going to react the way that I need it to react. I want my jig right there, straight up and down, or as close to vertical as possible. Once you're scoped way out, reel it up, drop it back down. Okay, Reel it up, drop it back down. Some of the other crazy styles that are out there have little 
you know, I, I guess we'll kind of call them steps, like a step pole boat. Everybody knows how a step pole boat reduces the friction under the boat. It increases speed and increases fuel efficiency and has little steps. Well, so does this jig. Little steps right there. Here's another one that also has steps, but on the sides rather than on the face of the jig. Now, what is that designed to do? Okay, it still falls fast, but when you're pitching it, when you're jigging it, it reduces the tension of the water and it makes a 250 gram jig feel like a 150 gram jig. You follow what I'm saying? So as you're working that jig, it feels lighter than it really is. Okay, and in situations where there's a lot of current, that could be a great jig to turn to because it also helps cut through the water. And like I said, it can take a he it, it makes a heavier jig feel lighter. Some of those cuts and indentations, as I mentioned, are on the face, like on this one, and some of them kind of on the side and go all the way around, like on this one. So really cool shapes and sizes and styles. I've also learned you don't need 50 or $60 jigs to catch fish. They're nice to have, however, $7 jigs can be deadly effective, okay, deadly effective. What I've learned is that these specialty jigs, okay, are, are very important in special scenarios. So for 90% of what you're doing, you can get away with a 10 to $15 jig. Still expensive, but not compared to 70 bucks, right? 10 to 15 bucks, you get cut off by a kingfish or you lose one to a shark or whatever, it's not the end of the world. You're not terribly disappointed, okay? You lose a $70 jig and I'm pretty pissed. So in turn, I found that you can get away with the more affordable jigs for most of your fishing. But for specialty scenarios like ultra deep water, uh, heavy current situations, then you need to turn to the leaders in the industry, companies like Seafloor Control, and pay extra money for a superior product designed for that sort of specialty application. And again, they, you know, I can't stress the shapes, how important that is in understanding how each of those shapes reacts in the water. A lot of these websites that are out there will give you some instruction, you know, or they'll give you, a, I don't want to say instruction, but they'll sort of display graphically how that jig swims in the water column. Does it, you know, dart more? Does it pitch more? Is it better for low current? Is it better for fast current? You know, so pay attention to those little details because they make a big difference. So once I've selected what jig I'm going to be fishing and what depth of water I'm going to be fishing, obviously the next thing to do is deploy the jig straight to the bottom if you want to fish throughout the water column and depending on what I'm targeting, I may or may not do that. If I'm specifically targeting bottom fish, snapper, grouper, tile fish, etc., porgies, okay, I want to fish the bottom of the water column. So I'm going to work that jig depending on the depth. If I'm fishing, you know, two to 400 feet of water, I might work it 50 feet off the bottom and then drop it right back down to the bottom, work it 50 feet off the bottom, drop it right back down, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes even tighter to the bottom. On the other hand, if there's blackfin tuna around, which obviously that's a you know prevalent species in our area, black fins will swim throughout the water column, I might work it 100 feet up off the bottom, 150, 200 feet, and then drop it back down. So that also is going to play a role. But one thing is for sure, I'm always going to go to the bottom. Okay, I'm always going to contact the bottom. Okay, it's very rare, if ever, that I'm going to drop a jig down and stop it before it hits the bottom. There, it, that just doesn't make sense to me. I want to know where that bottom is. I want to have what I like to call situational awareness. And I know a lot of things that I'm talking about may seem like I'm taking it a little bit over the top. No, I'm not. Okay, I'm addicted to this. You have no idea. And you, it, this is a system. It's a science. And you really, if you're going to do it, do it. If you're not going to do it and you're only going to do it half-ass, excuse my language, save your money. Don't do it. Okay, because you got to really make a commitment. So in turn, I'm going to drop my jig all the way to the bottom. I'm going to lock it up. 
I'm holding that reel, like I said, I'm palming that reel. The rod is under my arm. It weighs almost nothing. It's super light, super comfortable. I got the music jamming. I'm happy. I'm in my happy place. Okay. And what am I thinking about? The only thing that I'm thinking about is that jig. That's it. My goal is to bring that piece of metal to life. What do I want it to do? And as I load the rod, as I turn that reel handle, what happens is the rod loads. As I mentioned, the rod will bend. And then as I stop turning the handle, the rod's going to bounce back up. The jig is going to pitch off to the side. Okay, and then it will wobble and swim back down. And then I'm going to turn the handle again. But keep in mind, I'm determining how fast am I moving that jig, how fast am I swimming that jig off the bottom. If I turn one full revolution, I'm gaining potentially 36 inches of line with every crank of the handle, every one full revolution. I might be reeling up three feet of line. If I turn halfway, I'm only bringing it up half that distance. If I do quarter turns, I'm only moving it slightly. The jig is still pitching off to the side and swimming. It's still pitching and swimming, but I'm not coming up fast. You follow me? Because I'm targeting fish that are right on the bottom. I want to keep that wounded bait in front of their faces for as long as I possibly can. Because a fish will look at it, and he may not instantly go out and eat it. But if he keeps looking, keeps looking, OK, I got to eat it. I got to eat it, OK? I have to. If I don't eat it, the next fish is going to eat it, right? Fear of loss. So I want to keep that jig in front of that fish as much as I possibly can, especially if I'm targeting those bottom fish. So I can decide by, is it a full revolution that I'm turning? OK, like, you know what I'm saying? I can turn one full revolution each time. I can turn a half a revolution. I can turn quarter like this, just little bits, okay? Or I can mix. I can mix. I can do a full and then a half and then a quarter and then a half and then a full and I can control what that jig is doing and how erratically it's swimming. Okay, that's completely up to me. My rod, unlike vertical jigging where you're going crazy moving the rod, that is not what you're doing with slow pitch jigging. The rod is held out in front of you. As you turn that handle one revolution, the rod will load. You stop turning, the rod unloads. The jig swims off to the side. The jig wobbles. You load, the rod loads. The rod pitches the jig off to the side. And remember the key word, slow, slow, okay, slow. I've had people on my boat. I teach them how to slow pitch jig, or I take them slow pitch jigging. They're out there, and they said, you know, you said slow, and they're barely moving the jig. They're like, and I'm, looking, I'm like, what are you doing, man? Move the jig. Oh, got him, and they got him. And I'm like, how, how is that even possible, OK? I mean, how is that even possible? You're not even moving the handle, OK? But that's because the jig, remember what I said to you, that jig isn't laying on the bottom. It's not sitting in the water column vertically like this doing nothing. It's swimming. It's wobbling. That's how they were designed. That's how they're weighted, OK? They're weighted to wobble sideways, and they flash, and the glow, and they just drive fish crazy. So don't think that you're moving it too slow. You can move it slow. You can move it really slow. It's like a relaxing rhythm. Okay? You could speed it up. I found that when you're targeting the tunas specifically, speeding it up a little bit often has a benefit because, of course, tuna like that fast-moving prey. But on the groupers, the snappers, the tile fish, that kind of stuff, slow. Just take your time, get into that rhythm, and move it slowly. Okay? Once you hook a fish, and trust me when I tell you, there'll be absolutely no doubt in your mind when you hook a fish. Okay, there's no doubt. It's not like, I think I got a bite. No, you got a bite. And before we even say that, I do want to mention that when you are deploying your jig and you're letting it go down to the bottom, what you will find is when you pop that reel into free spool and you have your thumb on the spool, you'll put your jig in the water, the jig starts to sink, and line's going to go vroom. Vroom, vroom. It's, it's going to go fast and stop. It'll go vroom, 
Woo! Because what's happening is the jig is not under load. There's no tension on the jig. It's swimming. It's wobbling like this. Woo! Woo! And it's taking line. But then as it continues to sink, tension builds on the line. And now the jig goes from a vertical position, I'm, I'm sorry, from a horizontal position to vertical, and woo! Rockets right to the bottom. Okay, which is what you want. When it's rocketing to the bottom, your thumb is on the spool just with very light pressure. You want that jig, let it go. You don't want to restrict that jig, which is also why these reels have a little magnetic break on the side. As you loosen this little magnetic break, it loosens the spool and it allows the spool to revolve freely. That's what you want. Okay, you want to find that balance. With a heavier jig, you can tighten that a little bit. With a lighter jig, you want to back that off a little bit. You want that jig to get to the bottom as quickly as it can. However, oftentimes you'll be letting it down and suddenly your line goes slack. Just completely slack. What happened? Somebody ate that thing, baby. He ate it on the way down. He ate it. Okay. And it's going to happen. It happens a lot, especially with the tunas. It happens a lot. That's why it's so important at first, your first drop, that you do, you drop it all the way to the bottom because you want to know where that bottom is. You know, if you don't know where the bottom is, and I've seen it happen with guys on my boat where they're slack and he's like, oh, I hit the bottom. I'm like, dude, no, you don't. No, you don't. I'm still going down, and I dropped before you did. Lock it up, real. But they don't know where the bottom is. You know what I'm saying? So they didn't realize that they got a bite. And a lot of times, a fish will come by. He'll grab that jig. He may swim toward the surface or toward you. And right at first, you don't realize that you've got a fish on. Okay. So when that jig is going down, pay attention. Pay attention to that jig speed as it falls and what's happening. You will know when you hit the bottom. Okay, but there are times, especially in heavy current situations, where the jig will touch, it'll hit the bottom, and then line will continue to come off the reel. Why? Because you've got all of this line, and the current is grabbing that scope and continuing to pull line off the reel, but your jig is lying on the bottom. It already hit the bottom. So you need to be sharp. You need to pay attention. You know what I'm saying? You need to understand what is happening. Okay, and as soon as that jig hits the bottom, lock it up. And like I said, the rod is under your arm. You can go half revolutions, full revolutions. You can mix it up. Okay, but you're not going like this with the rod. Okay, you're not using the rod to jig the jig like we would with other types of tackle. You're using the reel to load the rod to pitch the jig. It's a very smooth rhythm. Use the reel to load the rod, the rod then pitches the jig. Different rods have a little bit more parabolic action and will pitch it even a little bit more than others. Like I said, now when you get a bite, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to know that you have a fish and I'm telling you another cool thing about slow pitch jigging, a two pound fish feels 22 pounds. Okay, like because it's so sensitive, you could feel every beat of that tail. You know instantly, oh, I got a tuna. Oh, no, got a tile fish. Nope, got a grouper. Okay, got a snowy grouper. You can tell just from how these fish are fighting because you can clearly feel everything translated all the way through the rod and into your body. It's incredibly sensitive. At the point that you hook a fish, this rod does not have a lot of backbone. We are not going to stick the rod in a fighting bell, lift and pump like we typically would do when we're fishing other sorts of tackle. We're not going to do that with this gear for a variety of different reasons. Number one, that's not what this rod was designed for. It wasn't designed to fight fish. This rod was designed to pitch jigs. Okay, and once you hook a fish, the rod is essentially out of the equation. Now you're fighting the fish with the reel. Okay, all you do is hold the rod pointed right at the line. You want to put a little bit of bend in the rod? You certainly can, but never lift it more than 90 degrees. Don't, you're never going to hide. Anybody here a fly fisherman? Okay, okay, you guys know the fly fishermen know that you never high stick it. Right? I'm not an experienced fly fisherman, but I know that at least you never high stick it. It's the same with this. I'm never going to hold a rod up here. Okay? I'm always going to hold a rod directly in front of me. It's got a bend in it. There's times I may, you know, lean back a little bit on the rod for sure, but I'm never going to be way up here. The rod's bent like this. Just not going to happen. That's not what this was designed for. 
Now there's a huge advantage to that as well. If I lift and come back down, lift, come back down, et cetera, et cetera, what is happening with that fish down there? I'm pulling them, I'm backing off. I'm applying pressure, I'm backing off. I'm applying pressure, I'm backing off, et cetera, et cetera. And what does the fish do? Potentially I may pull a hook, but I'm, I'm aggravating that fish, right? He's reacting now to, oh, I'm being pulled. He's going this way. I'm pulling him this way. It's like a tug of war. He's reacting to that forceful up and down lift and pump pressure. However, if I keep the rod right in front of me steady, and if I just crank nice and smoothly, now I'm not going to be able to all the time because if the fish is screaming line off the reel, I'm obviously not cranking because obviously you don't reel against your drag. That's next month's seminar. But in turn, <laughs> Okay, line's coming off the reel, you let them go. Otherwise, you're cranking, nice and slow. Crank, just turn the handle. It's a winch. That's now you're fighting them on a winch, okay? Not the rod. And surprisingly, I don't want to say surprisingly, but sometimes you'll hook a fish, especially in deep water, on a slow pitch rod, and you'll be like, oh, he's not that big. He's not that big. And it ends up being really big. Other times you hook a fish and you're like, oh my God, he's got to be, you know, this is a, whatever, a stud. And it's like a three pounder hook sideways, you know? <laughs> I mean, like all sorts of different things will happen. So don't judge what you think just because of the initial strike, you know? In other words, fight every fish the best that you can because a lot of times they end up surprising you. The closer to the surface that they get, now they start to realize something is very, very wrong. Because coming all the way up, you didn't forcefully apply all of that pressure. You just steadily reeled. Okay, You were reeling, you're coercing the fish up off the bottom, you're getting them to come up through the water column, but as he approaches the surface and it starts to get lighter and it starts to get warmer, he starts to realize this isn't good. This isn't good and of course now he starts to react. And it may be running, it may be digging back toward the bottom, a lot of different things depending on the species. But when you're fighting them, like I said, point the rod right down at the line. Okay, if you want to turn the rod a little bit, you know, which I often do, you certainly can, but understand this. Rods are built on a spine. This rod was not designed to be bent sideways. I'm not even going to do it more than this because I'm afraid the rod may blow up, okay? It wasn't designed to bend sideways. It was designed to bend this way. So if I'm going to even turn the rod and apply a little pressure, you see how I'm turning? Okay, I'm always using the rod like this, but I'm not going to go this way. I'm going to go this way. So it doesn't matter which way I'm standing, what my posture is, where I am on the boat. If I want to apply some more pressure, if I want to put more of a bend in that rod, whatever it is, I'm not going to go sideways like this against the action of the rod. I'm always going to turn the rod. And in that particular case, I can turn it sideways, and the whole rod could go like this, okay? Which, keep in mind, you hook a big tuna fish, he's screaming out there, there's times you're like this, sideways, okay? And the whole rod is bent, you know, sideways like that. So don't be afraid to do that, but never high stick it, never high stick it. As the fish approaches the boat and comes closer and closer to the boat, you know, obviously you're not going to flip fish with this rod. There's not enough beef and not enough backbone to flip a fish up and into the boat. Is your wife, you need to take that? Go ahead. We'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> FWC, is that what you said? <laughs> did he say catch and kill? <laughs> yes, I did. But anyhow, um, just, not on the way to the just not on the way to the Bahamas. That's right. So like I'm saying, you know, as the fish approaches the boat, take your time. You're not going to flip the fish up, okay? And, but don't make, a fatal, don't make a mistake that I made one day, which, by the way, we did catch this on camera. So I had a blackfin tuna on the end of my line, on, on the jig. Not a big one, 10 pounds, whatever, maybe. And he's right there next to the boat. However, I've got another rod right here in a rod holder fishing a big bait on the bottom for Warsaw grouper. 
And just as my tuna was right there, I look over and I say my, my bent butt rod go whack, get hit. So immediately I look down at my tuna and I'm like, oh, he's fine. And I lean my rod on the gunnel, just like this. All happened this fast, okay? I lean my rod right here, so it's on the gunnel right here. Tuna's right there. I reach over here, and just as I reach over here, I see the streak go, shoop, and I went, and I looked at all my guys on the boat who all looked at me, and suddenly there was silence on the boat. <laughs> Not a peep, because they know how much my slow pitch tackle means to me, okay? Not a peep. And I turned around and went, I bet you guys are pretty happy that I'm the one that did that and not one of you guys, right? Okay, so be careful because they are so light that it's easy to go like that. You know what I'm saying? Because the entire rod is so light. Also, even when I'm running on the boat, there's no gimbal on the bottom here. So I'm, my slow pitch rods are never on my rod holders on the outside of the boat when we're running, especially if it's rough. Okay, because the last thing I want, you know, is this thing bouncing out. And certainly it could happen. So they're always on the interior rod holders. Couple other advantages, huge, huge advantages to slow pitch jigging. Number one, it's clean. It's so clean. I'm not touching bait. I'm not touching squid. I'm not touching goggle eyes. I'm not touching pilchards. I'm not touching chum. I'm not touching any of that gack. Okay, I can go out there in a suit and tie if I wanted to. Okay, another one's flagged. What's in that beer tonight? So anyhow, it's very, very clean. Okay, and that's a big advantage. It really is. It's very, very clean. Number two, the best slow pitch bites that I have found, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., middle of the day. 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Bright sun, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So what does that mean to me? That means I used to have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Not anymore. All right? I'm sleeping in on Sunday, baby, and loving it. Okay? And suddenly here it is, 9, 10 o'clock. I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to go fishing for a few hours. Okay? And you can have some of the best action in the middle of the day. Because remember all of those guys that we talked about earlier that are fishing the edge of the reef? That's not where we're fishing. We're fishing deep water and on the bottom. Okay, so a tile fish, a tuna, a grouper, a snapper, you think he knows if it's 10 o'clock or 7 a.m.? He doesn't know the time. Certainly the light affects that fish, but he doesn't care. So in turn, you don't have to go at the crack of dawn. Okay, you absolutely don't have to go at the crack of dawn. It's affordable. Your initial investment, not so affordable, okay? But after that initial investment, and you have your gear set up. If I want to go fishing tomorrow, I'm ready. I don't need anything. I don't need another single thing. I don't have to buy chum. I don't have to buy live bait. I don't have to catch live bait. I don't have to worry about any of that because that is my live bait. That's everything that I need is right there. Okay, so it's affordable. It's clean. It's versatile. It works on almost everything, everything out here. Okay, eats slow pitch jigs. There are very few species that have yet to be, or that haven't eaten one of my slow pitch jigs, okay? I'm telling you, it's crazy effective. Again, though, understand, there have been times I've gone out here slow pitch jigging for four, five, six hours and caught zero, not a single thing. Okay, believe it or not, I know, it happens. Has that any, happened to anybody else ever? Has anybody ever gone fishing? and not caught a single thing? Let me tell you about what happened to me Tuesday. <laughs> I'll tell you about Tuesday. <laughs> Real quick, just a little side note. We went to go film the show. I had this wonderful idea. We're going to go out and film the show on Spanish mackerel because they've been catching some really big Spanish mackerel. Well, by 1 o'clock in the afternoon and haven't caught a single Spanish mackerel, okay, since 6 a.m., Trolling, chunking, jigging, casting, chumming, any way you can possibly imagine targeting Spanish mackerel, and didn't catch a single one, finally threw in the towel, okay? Because foolish me was so focused on the Spanish mackerel that even I didn't have a plan B in place for that particular day. So one o'clock, threw, threw in the towel. As I'm going back to the dock, 
I said, well, you know what? It's 1 o'clock, man. I'm, I'm not done fishing. I'm done filming because that's just not coming together okay, at all. But I'm not done fishing. Let's throw some deep drop gear on the boat and go deep drop and go catch golden tile fish. So I go out there and go golden tile fishing for four or five hours. You want to know what I caught? Zero. Okay. So, so far, two for two. Batting a thousand, right? So now I'm like, well, I got some slow pitch rods on the boat because I was doing some deep water jigging. I said, forget this. Let's go. It's late in the afternoon, low light conditions. Man, we can jig some blackfin tuna easily. This is going to be a snap. You want to know what I caught? Zero. <laughs> All right. So I struck out three times and didn't catch a single fish trying three different things all day long with the best tackle, the best boat, the best electronics, the best everything. It happens. It's fishing, right? And it's going to happen to everybody. You just have to learn. You have to learn from, you know, I learn even from those trips and I go, why? Why did I not catch anything? How bad do I suck? Why did I not catch anything? What happened? You know, you got to learn from everything out there and use it as a learning experience. That's what it's about. That's what makes fishing so exciting is that every day is different. Okay. Another thing about, you know, slow pitch jigging, like I said, it opens up an entirely new world to you. You were so stuck on, I've got to fish the edge. I've got a fish in that 100 to 200 feet of water right on that edge. You know, I've got to be targeting the snapper, I mean, the dolphin, the sailfish, you know, all of these popular species. And absolutely, they're awesome. They're incredibly fun to catch. They're great targets. But there's so much more. There's so much more out here. And really, to be a good, well-rounded fisherman, you need a lot of tools, right? Because not everything that you want to do on that particular day may pay off. The conditions may not be ideal for whatever. You know, there are some guys that are diehard daytime sword fishermen. That's all they do. Nothing else. They refuse to do anything other than daytime sword fishing. I understand it. Daytime sword fishing can be super exciting. It really can. It could also be super boring, but it could be super, super exciting. And you're targeting a fish that could be 50 to 500 pounds. But Florida and our region has so much more to offer. There's so many other species here and so many other venues. And I like to, you know, that's the attraction of fishing is learning so many different things, you know. So again, it opens up an entirely new world. Stop looking at everything out here in a two-dimensional way. Don't go out the inlet and think about a flat surface and a flat seafloor because it's not flat. The surface is flat, but the seafloor is not. It gradually slopes and then it falls off quickly. And there's different sorts of bottom. And depending on what you're targeting, that's the type of bottom you know, topography that you're looking for. If you're targeting the snappers and groupers, you're going to want to, of course, be by structure and wrecks and reefs. If you're targeting the deep water tile fish, you're going to want to be over mud. You know, so again, there's a lot of different venues. The tackle, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of, you know, that rod that I keep picking up is my go-to. It's a six foot three rod. It's rated for 150 to 350 gram jigs. And it's perfect for, if I can only have one slow pitch rod, that would be it. However, I also have the next, you know, the next in the series, the next size down. So this is even more parabolic and it's even lighter. Okay. It's even lighter. You can see the difference in this. It's faster. Okay, it's more parabolic. It's a faster rod even than the other one. It's got the exact same reel, the exact same Daiwa Saltiga Star Drag, but in a size 15, even smaller, okay, a narrower spool. I can still hold 400 yards of line, and I'm not using this outfit in 800 feet of water because it's just not going to have enough beef. It's just not going to do what I need it to do. It doesn't have enough action in the rod to pitch a heavy jig. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't have enough spring to pitch a, a heavy, heavy jig. So I'm not going to use it in ultra deep water. So on the lighter stuff, you know, in some shallower water, this really is my go-to outfit. It's so light and comfortable. How heavy is that? Incredibly light, isn't it? Okay. She just said it, incredibly light. Okay, it really is. I've got a smaller jig. What, what does that mimic? What does that look like to you? A little pilchard, a ballyhoo, 
a goggle eye, right? It looks like a bait fish. What out here does not eat silvery bait fish? Everything out here eats silvery bait fish, you know, small scaled fin fish, okay? Again, I think about this and I go, that's a ballyhoo. That's a six to eight inch ballyhoo that's alive on the end of my line. And instead of feeding out a live bait, I'm going to bring it to life and make it do what I want it to do. And I'm going to do it with this ultra light outfit that's so comfortable, but so incredibly sensitive. Incredibly sensitive. It changes the game. Understand also, because you are fishing jigs that have four hooks, if you are in the 100 yards within a wreck, you're going to get hung, all right? You're going to get hung. Don't fish on top of a wreck with your jigs. If you're going to, don't drop the jig all the way to the wreck. You know, that's one of the scenarios where we don't drop our jig to the bottom because I know that if this four hooks goes anywhere near that wreck, it's not uncommon for me to hang up on the wreck. Now, when you do get hung up, and you will, okay, and you will, the first thing you're going to want to do is, of course, back off on the drag a little bit and try and gently bounce that jig out. You've got four hooks. If you apply a lot of pressure, what's going to happen? You're going to bury those hooks even deeper into the wreck or into whatever structure. So gently try and bounce it out. What happens is if the bottom hooks are what is hung up in the structure, by bouncing it, oftentimes the top of the jig will bounce the bottom hooks out. If you, and you'll feel it as you're trying to bounce it out. You'll feel if you get any movement in the jig, then you know it's hung on the bottom hooks. If it's solid, rock solid, and you get no movement in that jig, the top hooks are hung up and you're going to have a very hard time getting that jig out. What I like to do is I back off on the drag, I put the rod in a rod holder, and I grab the line with my fingers, believe it or not. And I literally, in between your fingers, you can try and just yo-yo it out and bounce it out. But be careful because this ultra thin braid is like a laser, like a razor, and it will literally cut right through your fingers. So don't wrap it around your hand. Just grab it and literally try and bounce that jig out. If you cannot get the jig out of the bottom after all of your efforts, maybe you've even moved the boat up, you know, and around the other side to try and get it out. We've tried everything, especially with the expensive jigs. Okay? You try and get that out, trust me. But if you reach a point where you cannot get that jig out of the bottom and you're about to sacrifice the jig, I highly recommend tightening up on the drag as tight as it'll go. Okay? Point the rod right at the line. Hold the rod under your arm, thumb the spool, and just hold it. And just hold it, hold it, and feel that pressure build as the boat is drifting, right? The pressure is building. Something is going to give. It has to give. Something is going to give. The boats, you're not going to hold the boat back. Okay? You're not. So just hold it. And again, make sure that you're pointing the rod right at the line. Because if you hold the rod sideways, what's going to happen? Boom. You're going to snap the rod. So hold it right at the line. Hold it. Hold it. And feel, 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 feel. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Pop. Feel what that point is, that breaking point. You need to know what that breaking point is because that's where you can apply pressure to. I've seen a lot of guys fishing slow pitch jigs and slow pitch outfits and not realize how much pressure they could really apply. They're fishing too light of a drag and they're not fighting that fish properly. As long as nothing is damaged, and I keep stressing nothing is damaged because this braid is super, super strong until the fibers get damaged. Once one of those fibers, parts, which could easily happen from a hook point, from pliers rubbing up against it, from the rod, who knows, maybe at your dock or you put it up against a concrete seawall and the concrete scratched it, and you can't see it. You can't see it. Look at Walter, you can't even see that from there, can you? And it's intact. Imagine trying to see it that being damaged. As soon as that's damaged, weak point going to break in a second. In a second, it's going to break. You'll get a bite. Literally, you'll be slow pitch jigging and you'll feel whack pop before you even do anything. Just whack pop. Okay, that's it. Whack pop. All together now. Ready? One, two, three. Whack pop. 
Okay. So that's what's going to happen, just like that. So you've got to make sure that your braid is not damaged. But as long as it's not, and you've got good connections, and your drag is set properly, it's incredibly it's an incredibly strong outfit that you can put much more pressure on than you even realize. And it makes it exciting. It's fun. It's, it's fun. This will bring fun back into fishing. Okay, it really does. It brings fun back into fishing. So another question or something, you know, that's often been asked, can I slow pitch with a spinning rod? Okay. Now, this blank on this spinning outfit is exactly the same blank that's on my conventional outfit, but of course in a spinning rod configuration. Essentially, to effectively slow pitch jig, ideally you want conventional tackle. You're going to be far more effective with conventional tackle. You're going to have a lot more line capacity. You're going to have more beef holding the rod under the rod like that. And it's a far better scenario and application for slow pitch jigging. But I always bring the spinning rods because, you know, there's sometimes you want to switch off. Your arm gets a little bit tired after seven and a half hours, whatever it is, okay, and you want to just switch off. Or maybe I've got my daughter on the boat. I'm not putting that in her hand. Talk about backlash city, okay? Instead, I'll put this in her hand all day long, okay? So, you know, listen, this is fishing, people. It's about being fun. It's about having fun out on the water. And while it's a science and it's a system, it doesn't mean that you can't stretch the rules a little bit, okay? Don't stretch the rules. Who cares? You know, my brother, he's been my fishing partner for 40 years. He, he loves jigging as much as I do, and I take him out there, slow pitch jigging, and he's famous for dropping the jig to the bottom and yo-yoing it, like this. And I'm like, dude, you're killing me. Jig! He's like, I am jigging. Okay? And I'm like, but that's not really slow pitch jigging. He's like, I don't care, I'm jigging, and I'm having fun, and I'm catching fish, and he does! Okay, he does. He catches, I'm not saying his, you know, he, he catches his fair share, you know, whenever he's yo-yoing the jig. That's not what it was ideally designed for, but who cares? He's out there having a good time. We're fishing and he's catching fish, so don't be afraid to experiment. You know, don't be afraid to stretch the rules a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's okay, okay? There's no fish police. Where there's fish police, there's no fishing police, okay, that are going to say to you, you can't do that. You know, it's not going to happen. Do whatever the heck you want to do. Heck, I even take these, these spinners, truthfully, I'll use this slow pitch spinning outfit, which again isn't technically a slow pitch spinning outfit, but this is my new all-time favorite dolphin rod. It's incredibly ultra light, loaded with a ton of line, ton of braid. I'll put a live bait hook on it, and every single time I'm offshore, jigging, deep dropping, drifting, anything, I've got a couple of these spinners out with either a whole squid or a live bait just drifting in the water column because I don't care how I hooked that fish. So what if I wasn't jigging? So what if a 30-pound dolphin came up and, you know, ate that bait? And as a matter of fact, just the other day, something pretty funny happened. We had this exact rod in the stern with the squid. We had another outfit just like this up in the bow with a squid. We're deep dropping for golden tile fish. And we always drift the squid just in case any dolphin come by. I look out and I see this big bull dolphin, nice fish, solid 30 pounds. So he's swimming right up toward the boat. And immediately I scramble. I go to grab the spinning rod and I look over here and this one's doubled over. He's got it. He ate the bait. He's screaming this way. Just as I grab this rod, I look back and the stern rod doubles over. I'm like, oh, we got the bull and the cow. No, we had the bull and the bull. He ate both baits, okay? So we literally fought a 30-pound dolphin, two of us, with two rods, <laughs> but we got him, you know? <laughs> you know? So again, you know, don't be afraid to, to push the boundaries a little bit. Remember a couple other things. The more time that you spend slow pitch jigging, the better you're going to get the more rhythm that you will, you'll build. And you'll know when you get it. If you're out there and it's erratic and you're not really feeling it, it's because you really don't feel it yet. You know, though it'll reach a point where suddenly everything comes together. 
and it's an extension of your body. That's what it is, the rod, the tackle, the jig. It's you. Everything's an extension of your body, and you're moving that jig, you're pitching it, and you could feel everything. And you know when it comes together, you know when it's right, because it's an unmistakable feeling, you know? And the more you do it, like I said, the better you will get at it. Don't be afraid to experiment in new depths, in new venues, targeting fish that you never even knew were there. And I stress that because there are some species that we are catching in particular areas and particular depths that I never knew were there. Never knew. Ever. Okay? Ever. I, I jigged a bluefish in 350 feet on the bottom. I jigged flounder in 550 feet on the bottom. Did you know flounder swim in 550 feet on the bottom? Neither did I. Okay? Neither did I. And the list goes on and on. Strange occurrences that happen. Straight sharks right off the bottom, which of course, nothing too unusual about that, but really odd, strange occurrences that I'm like, you know, I never knew that that fish was there. I never knew that. Tuna in particular, blackfin tuna, and I'm not afraid to say this, you know, I'm an avid tuna fisherman. I've always been my entire life. That's the one thing that's, that I don't like about this region. We don't have big tuna. The closest we can get is to the Bahamas. Okay, but we don't, you know, the occasional yellowfin, one or two a year that are caught here, and, but that's about it. So what do we have? We have blackfin tuna. So I've always been on this mission to perfect and catch these blackfin tunas, especially the bigger ones, the studs, the 20 to 30 pound fish, which typically May, June are the two best months. You need a live well filled with live bait. You go out there kite fishing, fluorocarbon leader. We're throwing pilchards. We're creating a live chum slick. We're fishing goggle eyes or pilchards, and we get these big blue—I mean, these big blackfins to blow up on our kite baits. And then suddenly they're gone, and all day long you can't find them. They're gone. They're no, you're like, I'm mystified. I'm like, where are these tuna? Because at night. They turn on late, late in the afternoon, low light conditions. They turn on and they'll come up on the edge. So I've always suspected that, well, they're off the edge 200 feet. You know, they're not active. It's the middle of the day, low light, I mean, bright light conditions. Tuna don't like bright light, so they're not feeding at all. And basically they have lockjaw. And then late in the afternoon, they turn on. Huh, I was wrong, okay? The tunas are on the bottom eating squid and shrimp, okay, squid and shrimp. And I'm not talking squid like this. I'm talking squid like this, like this, one inch, half inch, these tiny little squid that are pra practically the size of your fingernail. They're picking right off the bottom in 400 to 600 feet of water, right on the bottom. That's where they are. They have to eat all day long. In the middle of the day, there's too much pressure on the edge, right? With all of the boats and too much light, too much commotion. So they literally will go deep and feed. And I never knew that. I didn't go out there and target those tuna there. It was an incidental catch. I caught my first one and I'm like, oh, I was just, you know, that, I, he was lost. And I caught another one. And I'm like, he was lost too. And I caught another one. And I'm like, well, the whole family's lost. Okay. And then as it went on and developed, obviously I put the dots together, pieced it all together, and realized what was really happening. So keep that in mind. Sometimes too, what's that? You should have listened when I said it. 400 to 600. Okay. Another quick thing here. Slow pitch jigging also gives you an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to create these new challenges. So one thing that I want to do is slow pitch jig these big 50 pound amberjack on the Rex right here, okay? However, I tried and I got my clock cleaned with these lighter rods with the 20 pound and 30 pound because I can't stop them, right? Now it's not open water. If it was open water, I got them. I'll fight them for as long as it takes, okay? I'm patient. I'll take, you know, however long I got them. But when there's a wreck, Right there. And what does an amberjack do as soon as he hooks, you know, as soon as he eats a jig? He, he, he's not stupid. He's not stupid. He goes right into that structure and instantly that thin braid rubs against the structure. Pop. Zing pow. One, two, three. Zing pow. Okay, that's what happens. So 
but it does give you the ability to come up with these new challenges. So what I did was I beefed up a jigging rod. And it's not essentially a slow pitch jigging rod, because as you can see, it's not as fast, it's not as parabolic. But it certainly still has that springy motion. Because remember what I said earlier, even though slow pitch jigging is a science, don't be afraid to bend the rules a little bit. It's about fishing, it's about fun. So I put together a heavier rod, and what is an Amberjack's favorite food on the wrecks out here? A vermilion snapper. Okay, Amberjack love vermilion snappers. Some people call them bee liners. You know, the little pink snapper. What does that look like? Does that not look like a little juvenile vermilion snapper? So I'm ready. This may, because that's when they occupy our wrecks. Same reel, but larger, a size 35. 50 pound PE line. I'm not concerned with the ultra thin line because I'm only fishing in 250 feet of water, 275 feet of water. So I'm not concerned with fishing that ultra light line. I'm more concerned with strength in this scenario, okay, with how much I can battle that fish and how much heat I can put on them. So I beefed up a heavier set of outfits. Again, not essentially slow pitch jigging, but certainly a you know, a uh, reflection of it, okay? Overall, you know, just be careful. I'm gonna wrap this up here and just tell you that, be careful. Slow pitch jigging is addictive, okay? It's addictive. Once you really start getting into it and seeing positive results, you just wanna do more. You just wanna learn more about it. You just wanna get more gear. And before you know it, you're breaking the bank on stuff, okay? But it's worth it because you only live once. That's first and foremost. And why die with money in the bank? Okay, that makes no sense. So, you know, and again, now here, we can offer you the slow pitch rods right from chaos, okay? Or call me directly, okay? And I'll make sure that we outfit you with the correct rod that you need, or the correct set of 10 rods that you need, even better, all right? And reels, et cetera. So, like I said, you know, super fun, super addictive, but I'm gonna finalize this and just say, make sure that you pay attention to the details. Learn from my mistakes. I wasn't using the correct knots. I wasn't using the correct leader. I wasn't using the correct line at the correct time, you know, as far as diameter. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way. But my goal is to share all of this information with you today so you can shorten your learning curve, keep it as affordable as possible, as fun as possible, and as effective as possible, okay? And, you know, I've had people say to me, you know, you shouldn't be sharing this information with everybody. And I say, why? Why not? I mean, do you own the ocean? Because I certainly don't own the ocean. It's a public resource that we all enjoy. It's a public resource that we all have equal access to. And truth of the matter is, no matter what I sit here and say to you, the ratio of people that are going to get up tonight, walk up to me and buy a $1,200 rod and reel, or six $1,200 rods and reels, and go out tomorrow and commit themselves to slow pitch jigging for more than 30 minutes, that ratio is probably about 0.01%. Right? It really is. But know that it's out there. Know that this venue is out there and know that this option is out there. And as you begin to learn and hear and see more about it, ultimately you'll transition some of your efforts. And like I said earlier, it's not the answer to everything, but it is absolutely a tactic that should be in your overall arsenal, you know, because it can be so effective. So double check all your knots, double check your drags, double check everything. Always check that braid to make sure that nothing is frayed. Just to be safe, pull off the top 20 feet after every trip and retie a fresh leader on. You know, check your knots. It's all that little stuff that's going to make a big difference out on the water. So.